Hi, everyone. This is Lynn Crawford with Hope Dementia Support. I'd like to introduce you to Debbie Fries, who is a home care consultant for Home Instead. And I'm sure that Debbie has some interesting things to share about herself, so I'm going to let her uh, go ahead. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you, Lynn. Very happy to be here. Hello, and welcome to today's workshop, Maintain Your Brain. Uh, I'll introduce myself a little further. Um, I work with Home Instead. I'm a home care consultant with uh, Home Instead for five and a half years now. Prior to moving up to Vancouver, about five and a half years, I was adult protective service investigator down in Medford, Oregon. I have a bachelor's degree in psychology, um, behavioral science. I have a passion to help the aging population to live the best lives that they can have by providing this type of education to not only them, but to community resources, um, community partners, and providing just lots of resources to help seniors and their families um, get the best information that they can. So that's me. <laughs> so today we're going to um, cover some very important topics. Learning Debbie, about... Yes. Let me interrupt one second just to remind everyone that uh, uh, we'll kind of uh, keep an eye on the Q&A and the chat, and we'll make sure that everyone's questions are answered either at the end or when you specifically ask questions. Okay. And now I will leave you alone. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Lynn. So we're going to cover the, um, the importance of brain health across the lifespan, um, the impact of caregiving on the, on the brain, brain health. We're going to understand the six key areas of brain health. We're going to complete a brain gain action plan and then learn the signs of cognitive decline and any next steps. So the importance of brain health across the lifespan. We go to the doctor for a physical, but they often fail to do a checkup from the neck up. Our brain health across the lifespan is just as important as our physical health. And let's talk about why that is important. The reason that brain health is important is because anyone with a brain is at risk for brain-related diseases. The most commonly known is, is Alzheimer's and other dementias. There is a, a growing prevalence of Alzheimer's and dementia, but there is a lot we can do to reduce our risk, which we will cover in today's presentation. In the U United States, 6.7 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's today. About every 65 seconds, someone in the US develops Alzheimer's disease. It is the sixth leading cause of death in the US. And unfortunately, there is no cure for Alzheimer's disease. As you can see by the graph, without a cure, the number of people aged 65 and older with Alzheimer's is projected to hit 13.8 million by the year 2060. And 44% of Americans aged 50 to 64 reported being worried about developing dementia. And these staggering numbers make the topic of brain health even more important. So there are some risk factors for cognitive decline, which we'll go over. Age, the greatest risk factor for late onset Alzheimer's are older age. And there are certain genetics or genes that can put a person at higher risk for some aging brain diseases. However, the majority of these genes does not guarantee that you will develop this disease. A family history is not necessarily um, for an individual to develop, but it is a factor. And then there's modifiable risk factors, and these are environmental and lifestyle. And that is the section we're going to focus on right here, the modifiable risk factors. So those health-related risk factors 
um, where we do have control and influence. Um, these are things that can help to reduce our risks for cognitive impairment over the, over the course of our life. Blood pressure, high blood pressure can increase the risk. Proper management of blood pressure throughout our lifetime can help reduce risk. Cardiovascular health is tied to blood pressure. What is good for the heart is good for the brain. Addressing any issues that arise is critical because the blood flow to our brain is important. Strokes can cause the type of dementia called vascular dementia, which occurs when there is damage done to the brain due to a lack of blood flow. Tobacco prevention, or stop smoking or not smoking or quitting has a lot of health benefits. It is also great for brain health. Diabetes prevention and management with insulin, that can play a role in the formation of um, plaques and tangles in the brain that are believed to um, cause Alzheimer's. So preventing and managing diabetes becomes important for reducing the risk of, of cognitive decline. Obesity and control of obesity is linked to many of the health conditions we have covered, um, such as heart disease and diabetes. So maintaining a healthy weight is good for you and your overall health and your brain. Injury prevention, it's important to protect yourself from brain injuries and concussions. So if you're out riding your bicycles or skating, um, wear, that, wear that helmet. And if you uh, do have an injury or accident to the head, be sure that you, get, um, you go to the doctor and get that properly addressed. Um, hearing loss. There is a link between hearing loss and dementia. One study found that the use of hearing aids can reduce the risk of cognitive decline by about half. Um, there are several theories about this link, but those who suffer from hearing loss. One theory is that it may take more brain power to process what people are saying, and it could leave less cognitive resources for processing that information. Uh, another theory is, is that less auditory information is being received in the temporal lobe, causing the part of the brain, the brain to shrink quicker. Uh, the temporal lobe is also responsible for other important brain functions. Hearing loss is also concerning because individuals might be missing out on social interactions, which is important for our brain health. And we'll cover that a little bit more during this presentation. So the impact of caregiving of brain health. So whether you are a person who's experiencing cognitive loss due to dementia or Alzheimer's, um, or you're a caregiver, family caregiver, caring for, for a loved one, um, both are impacted by that. So it's important to note that being a caregiver can put you at higher risk of cognitive impairment as well. So there are the risks that um, are involved here, it's important to understand the realities of caregiving. Sometimes we don't necessarily have that choice. It's just where we're at in our life, in our, in our situation. Um, it, could it could result in uh, an in increased risk of not only cognitive impairment from you, for you, but also other health issues that can come up, especially not taking care of yourself, and we will address that as well during this, this presentation. Um, so just keep in mind that it caring for someone puts you at risk as well, cognitively and physically. Um, family history of Alzheimer's could put a caregiver or anyone at higher risk, um, especially if you've if you have a parent or a sibling um, that ha has a type of dementia. Increased stress and strain um, due to that role as being a, a caregiver have higher 
stress than just the general public who's not being subjected to that situation. Um, demands on the caregiving limit and, and time for that self-care. And we'll talk about what self-care means and what that's what you can do for yourself um, to take those breaks that you need. Because caregivers are juggling a lot. Um, it's, it's hard to engage in self-care um, when you're taking care of someone else. Sometimes your health care gets put back on the it's put on the back burner and we see caregivers make, um, you know, they're, they're not taking care of their self because they're worried about their loved one, making sure all their needs are met, that they're going to their appointments. Um, but sometimes they forget or just don't put the importance on themselves to make sure that their health is taken care of. So that can result in high blood pressure, diabetes, and um, sometimes they can get sicker than the person they're caring for. The um, sleep, exercise, eating habits, we'll talk about these as well. Um, it impacts everything. Um, especially if the person you're caring for, it wanders at night. Um, caregivers might feel that they don't have time to exercise, sleep well, they're sleeping with one eye open. Um, cooking healthy for themselves, and all that does affect our, our body, our heart, our brain. And also caregivers sometimes can feel isolated because they're not doing their social activities the, the, the way that they used to. Um, and some people talk about how they sort of pull away from family and friends because they, you know, kind of feel like they don't know how to act around other people and other people don't know how to respond to them and don't have an understanding of maybe what they're going to. So caregivers are pressed for time. And um, we'll, we'll point out some small, even some small changes that caregivers can do that might make a difference in your own brain health. So we'll talk about the key six areas of brain health. So you have a worksheet, hopefully, Lynn, I know set a couple of worksheets. The first one is, uh, first of all, it's never too late um, to live a brain healthy lifestyle. And if you think about your own um, brain health journey and complete this self-assessment um, and how you rate yourself in each area, hopefully you receive that before this workshop, but I am going to show it right here. I'll go back to that other slide. So um, it has, is it on the screen. Take a, take a minute or so to kind of go through this if you haven't already and sort of assess yourself. Rate yourself between one and 10 on each of these six categories. The key areas of brain health. Exercise. Do you never exercise? That would be a one or a two. Sometimes five or six, um, you have a regular exercise routine, nine or 10. And if you do, kudos to you. That's hard for anyone to do, but it's very important and especially important for, um, for aging adults and caregivers who are caring for family members um, who, are, who are aging. Eating healthy, sleep and relaxation, your social connections, and then how do you engage your brain in day-to-day um, -day tasks? Do you, are you getting educated? Are you in school? Do you take additional classes? Things like that. And then how do you manage stress? Because we all have stress and coping mechanisms and how we handle it, and some are positive and some are not so positive. And in fact, a little bit of detriment um, to ourselves. So we'll talk about that as we get into this. So just take a glance at this if you haven't already, kind of keep this in mind as we go through these, um, these next slides. So the first one is exercise. 
Movement is important. Um, we all know that exercise is good for us, uh, but we might not consider that it is good for the brain. Those who do exercise have a lower risk of developing cognitive decline. It promotes the heart health, cardiovascular health. Um, and again, remember what's good for the heart is good for the brain. There is that connection with uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, that brain-heart connection. There have been a lot of studies about that. And it has um, many benefits, not only to our, our brain health, but our physical health, improving the blood flow to the brain. It can reduce inflammation, um, lower stress hormones, and just an, you know, an all over good, feel good you know, situation. How much to exercise? The American College of Sports Medicine recommends 150 minutes of moderate exercise. And that is about, and that's per week. So that's 30 minutes, five times a week. More is better, um, but this seems to be the sweet spot. How to do that, you can incorporate a variety um, into your exercise routine. So some aerobic activity, um, walking, biking, swimming, along with some strength training, lifting weights, Pilates, yoga, and then balance exercises. Maybe you like Tai Chi or yoga. You can add those into your exercise regimen. It is important to note that if you don't exercise regularly, um, always consult your healthcare provider um, before starting a new exercise routine. So throughout this um, presentation, there are these quick start, start tips that we will kind of stop for a minute and you can put your uh, um, some information in the chat box, but incorporate at least 30 minutes walk per week. You can start slow and add on to those um, statistics statistical numbers. So have a friend join you for that 30 minute that not only, you know, kind of holds you accountable, um, gives you some socialization, gets you away from um, maybe that stress that you might be under. There are a lot of YouTube videos out there. A um, lot of things that you can just look up that might be fun for you to do something that gets you that exercise going in your life. Um, this is where I'd like to have people then put in the chat, any other suggestions, you know, what, what works for you? What tips might you have for other participants on this call that maybe other people haven't thought about? I'm sure someone has a great tip out there. Jumping jacks, chasing after grandkids, walking the dog, which is walking. But I think if you have someone else to be accountable, accountable for like a dog, that, that might get you energized and going a little bit. Lynn, are there any comments in chat? Did I lose you, Lynn? <laughs> well, we'll just move on then. Um, the second. Um, Sorry. Uh, oh, that's. Can okay. you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, I had a had a delay there. Swimming at the Y, as okay. one, and uh, just getting up between your commercials, and and jogging in place. I like those. So there's a couple. I wonder what people do. I mean, those are great things, especially for indoors, but does anyone hike, you know, in the summertime, take hikes or anything like Pardon that? Me. Especially this time of year, getting out and starting to dig in the dirt. 
Yep, I like gardening. Do people walk at the mall anymore? There used to be the mall walkers, which not, I mean, it kind of gives you some entertainment as well. <laughs> I think that's a good one. All right, well, we'll go on to the next um, brain health to, uh, category and that's eating. Eat right. We have one more comment real quickly, which I sure. think is really appropriate because several of my group do that. Plus we have a Hope Walks map there and that is bird watching at the wildlife refuge. I love that one. Yeah. I think anything we can do to stay active and entertained at the same time is, uh, it just makes it a little easier and, and a lot more fun especially if you can do it with friends and family. And I don't know about you, but after I've exercised or worked hard, let's say I'm doing an event and I have to set up a table at a resource fair <laughs> and I'm running around up and down the stairs and I'm just working hard all day. I sleep better at night and I feel better. I just feel better. Your body just, it just rejuvenates. We also have a comment about fishing. Oh yeah. Well, and I mean, fishing is sort of exercise because you're having to, you know, move anytime you're moving your body and not sitting in front of the TV, watching fishing, you're going and doing fishing. Not that watching fishing on TV is bad. I think that's, that's fun and entertaining, especially if you're running in place while you're watching fishing. <laughs> and, you know, what about those games, the, um, I, I'm not into it, but there's bowling. You can bowl, you can play tennis right in your living room. My oh, grand... the, Wii, the Wii games. Yeah, the Wii games, yeah. I'm kind of at that age group. I know a little bit about it, but obviously I don't know what they're called, but I have done those and it's fun. You know, it's another way to interact and you're up and down and you're just moving your, your muscles, your arms. Good stuff. There's a question here about uh, how about some suggestions for how to motivate yourself to get exercise? Well, motivation is is something that's within us. You a coach cannot motivate a player to to play. Motivation is internal. Um, sometimes that comes from some life change um, that kind of wakes you up and says, I need to, you know, make this change, but I would say start slow, you know, just give yourself one little goal for the day, write it down, make yourself accountable, write it down and say, tomorrow, I'm going to walk to the end of the street and back. That's it. And then the next day, I'm going to walk around the block, you know, just take it in little pieces, little steps. And when you'll find yourself, it, usually, it takes about two weeks to 20, two weeks to 21 days to change a habit or break a habit. So once you just force yourself kind of just to, just, just, you know, I can do this, I can do this. And it's a lot of, you know, internal talk, self-talk, but also write down the, the benefits of your goals. So write your goals and the benefits. If I do this after three weeks, I am going to feel better. I'm going to reap the benefit. Even though it's kind of hard those first few days, it's just you kind of have to force yourself to do it. As long as you're healthy enough, you know, depending on what exercise you're, you're looking at doing. But I think write it down, um, even talk to a friend or a family member, like ask for the help. Can you hold me accountable? Ask me if I've exercised today. And um, not that I want anyone to feel shame for anything, but it's just, you know, if you have that trusted partner, you know, just have someone help you be accountable for yourself. Those would, that would just be a suggestion that I have. Anything else on that, Lynn? No, that's, that's it. Good okay. move forward. All right, so eating right. That's another thing we know um, 
that what we put into our body affects our body. I kind of experienced this myself personally recently. Um, eating healthy um, helps fuel the brain, helps us to think clearer, but it's the, it's the good foods. It's not just eating junk, it's eating the good stuff. Um, a lot of people have heard of the Mediterranean diet. This is rich in, in fish and green leafy vegetables, whole grains, um, nuts, uh, legumes. These are known to um, reduce the risk of de cognitive decline. But again, make sure you check with your healthcare provider um, before making any major changes to a diet because there could be some underlying health conditions that might affect what you're doing um, which what you're eating. So always consult that if you're making, you know, major changes to your diet. So um, there's no silver bullet on on how to maintain healthy eating and and healthy brain. Um, but it's a combination. Just think of a combination of nutritional factors that supports the brain health. Eating foods high in saturated fats, like red meat, butter, dairy, um, they are associated with um, the development of cognitive um, degenerative diseases, including heart disease and Alzheimer's disease. Instead, aim for lean meats and healthy fats, like olive oil, um, avocados, on special occasions, I think, you know, go ahead and eat dessert in moderation. You know, you have to also consider dairy-free, gluten-free, that sort of thing. Um, but it, you know, those sweets can associate with high levels, you know, sugar intake and diabetes. So spiking blood sugar can impact the brain. So try, maybe try baking at home. My daughter does this. She bakes bread a couple times a week for her family using whole grain flours. Um, dark chocolate and fruit and oats. Um, use Try baking in lieu of buying store-bought treats that are, you know, very carb-loaded, ultra-processed oils, things like that. There's a little more extra effort but making those simple changes again creates a habit, and then before you know it, you're, you're that's all you're doing. You've made such a lifestyle change that you're seeing the the uh, impact and the results of those changes, and you just you, you're going to feel better. Dark chocolate um, it contains flavonoids, you know, which help with uh, that's an antioxidant. I know there's been like. A lot of controversy about uh, chocolate and coffee. We'll talk about coffee later, but the dark chocolates, um, the solid 75 or 72% solids and unsweetened cocoa powder have the greatest benefit. So it's okay to eat chocolate in small quantities and it actually can, um, you know, has that influence on the antioxidants our bodies do need. And then adding fish and other foods rich in omega-3. Omega-3 is a type of fatty acid that the body can't produce on its own. And it's known to be very good for your brain. If you like fish, not everyone does. I love fish. But eating it twice a week, um, five ounces twice a week of omega-3, um, such as salmon, cod, haddock, tuna, halibut, um, if fish isn't your thing, try walnuts, flax seeds, soybean instead. And then um, vegetables, spinach, kale, broccoli, other leafy vegetables, and then fruits. Um, they're rich in brain-loving nutrients. Blueberries, raspberries, blackberries, uh, they're packed with antioxidants. And they're good for your brain. And also, if you like berries and you like picking berries, that can kind of coincide with exercise. Go berry picking um, somewhere, and then you, um, you 
get those two birds with one stone. Whole grains, um, oats, barley, quinoa, um, they're rich in vitamin B um, and they help to reduce inflammation of the brain. Spices such as turmeric, cinnamon, uh, ginger, they're packed with antioxidants and decrease harmful inflammation as well. Um, hydration, don't forget to hydrate because it's, it's really the most important part of your overall health and well-being. Um, our brains are made up of 75% water. So keeping hydrated is good for the brain health and the function. Why it's best in water, just plain water, um, but water can get boring. So there are um, flavored waters or you can put your own herbs like mint, uh, you can put vegetables in there, fruit, so strawberries, watermelon, cucumber water, lemon. So you can mix it up a little bit. And then uh, green coffee or teas. Green tea um, is a great choice. It has you no know, caffeine if that's an issue. And coffee has been shown to improve memory and potentially decrease the risk of dementia. They say up to three cups of black coffee a day are recommended. I personally can only handle one coffee and it has to be half and half because <laughs> the caffeine kind of bothers me a little bit, but um, tea at night for me, green tea, sleep helps me sleep and kind of relaxes me before I go to bed. That is where we get the maximum benefit that our brain deserves. Now, red wine or grape juice in moderation. Um, resveratrol is found in red wine and it comes from the skin of the grapes. It's a potent antioxidant. It can possibly reduce the damage associated with aging and may protect against the formation of damaging plaques in the brain. But stick with the recommended daily amounts of one glass for women or two for men. And if you are not a wine drinker, just drink grape juice. So this um, reservoir tall is, is found naturally. There is a supplement, but I also suggest talking with your doctor before doing that. But it may benefit your met met uh, metabolic health, cardiovascular, joint cognitive function, certain diseases such as Alzheimer's, heart disease. Um, but again, there are certain times you don't want to use it and consult with your doctor about that. So here's another quick start tip. For caregivers with limited time, have healthy groceries delivered to save you time if you don't have time to go to the store. Um, a lot of times they, if you get into a habit of having groceries delivered or at least have an order to go pick up from the store, they, you, usually they'll save what your last items were. And then spend about you know 30 or so minutes prepping when you bring your groceries home so you have easy, readily available snacks and food ready to heat up or pull out of a baggie or a container and um, be able to eat a healthy snack as opposed to a processed snack or going through a drive through for Carl's Jr. Wendy's hamburger. Not that those aren't good once in a while, but there are better healthy alternatives. So again, Lynn, I would really welcome anyone's thoughts in the chat about other suggestions for um, anything surrounding eating healthy, how to save time, and suggestions on, on good snacks and the way to prep yourself, set yourself up for success. This is everyone's opportunity to tell Debbie what, what you do. Yeah, what, what do you do for, for getting yourself ready? For maybe at the beginning of the day, if you, if you work, what do you take to work with you in your lunchbox? If you're retired, you know, do you allow yourself every two to three hours to go, you know, get a healthy snack? That would be a good suggestion of mine. 
is to set a schedule where you eat little small meals or snacks every two or three hours throughout the day. Eating a good healthy breakfast, a good healthy lunch, and a nice healthy dinner, having those balanced meals throughout every day and then snacks in between is really the ideal way to get that fuel to your body and to your brain. Let's see. We have, uh, okay, Richard, I'm going to let you talk. Oh, hi, Richard. But you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Can you unmute him? No. Then? He has to unmute himself. Okay. There. Is that better? There. Yep. Hi, okay. Richard. <laughs> anyway, my wife's in memory care, so I but I've been so been bachelor for about the uh, last 16 months. Talk about the food. I've switched to my diet about three or four months ago, and I've been really pleased. I'm surprised actually how much uh, I come out of a whole carload of food, but mostly vegetables, it's a lot less expensive, all the processed food I used to buy. And uh, so I always have some uh, vegetables chopped up to eat, or I, I come up with weird combinations sometimes, but uh, I've really found that going to the you know, lots of vegetables and fruits have really helped me. So. Oh, great. And that that's wonderful to hear, Richard. Um, do you go to the grocery store to, to buy the your I, food? I go buy my own. I go buy my own. I shop myself, yes. Okay. But I, 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 the more I've studied, the more I see, look at things I used to buy. I'm not buying that stuff. I'm not buying bacon. I'm not buying this here. I'm, I'm not buying that. I'm not buying honey nut Cheerios anymore because that's worse. Regular Cheerios are a lot more healthy than than the uh, the honey nut ones. So I, I've really started to change my diet over the last a few months, and I can really tell the difference. But I love the vet. Fortunately, I love all vegetables. I mean, I even like uh, I'll chop up Brussels sprouts, and I will throw a little bacon in my Brussels sprouts when I, when I fry those up. And uh, but I have freeze dried uh, cauliflower, and I I just have all kinds of vegetables, <laughs> all kinds of weird combinations too. <laughs> well, that's that's really encouraging, and thanks for sharing. And that gave me an idea that we have a really wonderful farmers market in in Vancouver, and. That's another great way to get your fruits and vegetables and, and your exercise to walk around and enjoy the, the nice days that we have here in the spring and summer. I tried a couple of new things. I make beef stew and I put in, instead of using baked potato, I've used uh, sweet potatoes or yams. They took really good in the stew. And yeah. uh, so I've tried that. Also caramelized onion. I just put that in anything. It makes anything better. So. <laughs> I love it. That's the way I cook too. I just introduced well, myself again to uh, butternut squash the other. I'm gonna night. put my I'm gonna put my hand out here. I talked enough. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you for your input, Richard. We appreciate it. And we've got lunch is my favorite meal. Uh, another person says uh, that um, he takes his snack when he's out and about, usually veggies. Great. All Bruce good. says, love the whole whole food plant-based diet idea. Yeah. Hi, Ruth. Nice to see you on here. <laughs> and Judy says, one cup of fruit. Walmart has the frozen mixed fruit already prepped. Two tea tablespoons of peanut butter, a quarter cup of muesli for breakfast, big salad with nuts and quinoa for lunch. I love it. I make a really good lentil salad. It has great vegetables in it. I make a big batch and you can eat it on eat on it all week. Ruth can attest to that. She's had my lentil salad. Now, I know a lot of people are, you know, wanting to eat organic fruits and vegetables, and that's fine. I think that's great. It's healthy. They're just a little more expensive. So it's really a personal preference as to you know, your thoughts and feelings about eating organic um, versus regular vegetables and fruits. But I think getting any of it in your system is is better than than nothing or better than, um, you know, a processed bar or something. Any other comments there, Lynn? 
that's all the comments that we have okay. right now. All right, we're gonna move on to the third one and that is sleep and relaxation. So we all know why we sleep. Our bodies have to, they break down if we don't get enough sleep. Um, it helps us with recovery. Um, two thirds of the people are, are chronically sleep deprived. Um, sleep is super important um, for a number of reasons. The recovery helps flush any toxins out of our, our body and our brain, especially our brain during sleep. Our, our, it heals tissues in our brain. All this stuff is going on behind the scenes. We don't know it, but we reap the benefits if we can truly be committed to helping with, with, our, with healthy sleep. It also helps strengthen our, our memory sensors. Um, it improves learning. I know I went through a spell when I wasn't sleeping well and you just feel foggy the next day. And there are things that we can, we'll talk about ways to help, help you be able to fall asleep and stay asleep without, um, without using drugs and alcohol. Some people need that and that's, that's fine. Um, but there are natural ways to do it. The myth is losing, a, losing sleep is not a big deal. You can catch, catch up over the weekend. And the problem with that is um, we just never really catch up, you know, because one night turns into two nights and three nights and all of a sudden you're feeling exhausted and it's affecting your brain, it's affecting your body. Um, so the ways that we can um, do this, some of the secrets are to stick to a schedule. Um, wake up and go to bed at the same time each day if you can. Um, prioritize your sleep and create a sleep hygiene routine. So when I say stick to that schedule, some people think, oh, I'll sleep in over the weekend. Really, if you're on a schedule, it's Monday through Sunday, Monday through Monday. Um, go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time. If it's a holiday, if it's a weekend, just keep that routine steady and constant. Um, if you do change it, you can quickly sabotage um, your health, your circadian rhythm. And then uh, it creates those irregular sleep patterns, which is detrimental to your health, especially long term. Don't be a night, night owl. The older we get, um, the earlier your bedtime will become and the earlier you, you will naturally wake up. Um, but your overall sleeping patterns um, shouldn't change. Wake up to early morning light. Expose your eyes to sunlight first thing in the morning. Um, it just helps you set your body clock. We're wired, we're really naturally wired to get up early and absorb the sun rising. And I know that's a little more difficult in the winter time. They do make um, not, uh, lights that will gradually, you can set the timer in the morning to wake up with natural light. Um, so that's that's one option. And then when you do wake up, you know, get yourself moving. Um, you know, that's part of that exercise. It's good for your brain. Um, just, get, you know, get up, make your coffee, make your breakfast, get your paper, you know, walk through the house, you know, whatever that is, walk, take the dog outside, uh, feed the animals. Um, but just, you know, get your body moving first thing in the morning. And then watch what, what you're eating and drinking. Avoid caffeine after lunch and, and don't eat or drink anything three hours uh, before bedtime. And mostly be, so you prevent waking up to have to use the bathroom. And then be be careful about alcohol intake before bed. Um, it does affect your sleep cycles. So if you have a glass of wine with dinner, I would stop there and not, you know, drink anything right before sleep because it, it does affect your sleep patterns. Your medicines, some prescriptions, whether over the counter um, or prescribed, can impact your sleep. Um, if you're having problems with that, talk to your doctor to see if you know, meds are impact or having that impact on your sleep. 
maybe there's some alternative or different types um, or taking them different types of the day, that sort of thing. That could be a simple change that could be made, but talk with your physicians. That cool, quiet, quiet, dark environment. Set up ideal sleeping situations. The temperature of the room, they say between 60 and 67 degrees. Sleep in a dark room and avoid any electronic devices. The blue light from your TV, your phones, your tablets, um, they stimulate our alert centers in the brain and that can help us from sleeping. Uh, people, some, some people use a, a sleep mask um, or blackout curtains in their bedroom to help with any light that comes through, especially with work schedules. If you, if you uh, need to sleep during the day um, because of working in the evening or at night, um, those blackout curtains really help. And then establish bedtime rituals. 30 minutes before you go to bed, wind it down, start that ritual, create that routine. And again, it takes you know, about 21 days to start a new habit or break a habit. Um, so start that 30 minutes, your brain is going to naturally train itself that it's time for bed. Um, it could be a warm bath, it could be some soothing music, essential oils, um, cozy night clothes, uh, soak your feet in a massager, whatever your routine is, reading, um, praying, meditating, whatever, whatever that ritual is for you, start at 30 minutes before you want to shut those eyes and actually get to sleep. And then um, know the warning signs if you're getting poor sleep. Sleep, there are sleep disorders um, and symptoms can be persistent and just understand and know when you're having persistent trouble falling asleep and staying asleep. If you're, if there's frequent snoring, um, if you're persistently tired during the daytime, grinding your teeth at night, waking up with a headache, or an aching jaw might be your clenching or grinding your teeth. Um, if you experience any of those types of systems or uh, symptoms, again, speak with your healthcare provider because they might have some um, some suggestions or um, something to change your schedule or your routine that might help you get to sleep. So we're going to uh, go to the next quick start tip. I, I talked about some things for a routine, um, wearing eye mask, cutting off, off activities. What do all of you do? What are some, some tips that you could share with others that uh, might be helpful? What works so for you? We have a comment uh, about the Calm app, which is actually something that uh, uh, I have had group members tell me about. Yes, that, that is a great one. And another I, one, the Insight Timer. What's it called? Insight? Insight Timer. Is that one that um, regulates the light? To, to I haven't heard of Insight Timer. I'm going to write that down and look it up. Yeah, I haven't heard of it either. I'll look it up. I will sometimes um, pop uh, right up. It has meditation in it. Okay. Yeah, there are 15,000 15, pieces of content. Wow. <laughs> I would say it's worth looking at. I would say too, but I would say look at it during the day and kind of see what works for you. So you're not having your phone on when you're trying to go to bed seeing which, which one works better. Look at them in the morning, look at them during the day, and then try one out at night. And Anne says that she has an aura ring that reminds her of when to start winding down, tracks sleep, etc. I like that. 
Yeah, I know there are a lot of devices, you know, an Apple Watch, I think, has that monitoring, you know, different te technology features will tell you how much sleep you're getting. It uh, connects to your um, circadian rhythms. Sometimes for me, it's just as simple as um, turning on Alexa and and saying, play rain sound noise. That's what I do with my grandkids. Play rain sound noise. And they have a lot of different noises. They have green noise, brown noise, white noise. Um, so try what, you know, just try different things and whatever works and sticks. That's what I would go with. Any other comments in the chat, Lynn? That's what we've got. Okay. So social connection, you know, we uh, very important, our social interaction with folks. Um, it helps us to thrive, um, especially when it comes to brain health. A rich social network provides sources of support, helps reduce stress combats depression and enhances intellectual stimulation. Uh, studies have shown those with the most social interaction within their community experience the slowest rate of memory decline. Enjoying close ties with your friends, family member, um, as well as meaningful social activities have many brain health benefits. And it's not just the number of social connections, it's about the type and the quality, quantity, the purpose of the relationship. Those are, those are things, you know, to determine for yourselves. Some tips on staying socially engaged, focusing on relationships and activities you enjoy most, people you wanna spend time with. Um, that you enjoy spending time with that, that doesn't cause you stress or doesn't feel obligatory. Those are the ones I would focus on. Maintaining um, social connections with people of, of varying ages. Um, you might learn something from someone younger than you or older than you. So keep an open mind when it comes to those types of connections. Um, connecting regularly with friends and relatives, your neighbors, church families, whatever um, groups you might be involved with. So that regularity of connecting um, helps with that brain health. And then also look for opportunities that allow you to participate in, in different things. You can volunteer, you can, you can tutor, you can join a book club, um, a cooking class, but challenge yourself. And again, it might be like exercising, how to get motivated, write maybe one thing down. I'd like to do this and, and then take the step of researching what you want to do, make those calls, get yourself involved and, and make that step. And then also we can't forget our pets. People aren't the only source of a loving relationship. I tell you, I watched my um, grand dog for three weeks while my kids were away. When she went back home, I was lonely. I missed her. <laughs> it, it was sad. So pets are really important parts of our family and our, and our um, so, social life. Quick start tip. Anyone have any comments about social engagement that I might not have mentioned? Things that you do that help stimulate your brain and interact with others. I decided to walk away from a high maintenance relationship. Caring for my husband takes a lot of energy. I am happier. And volunteer. Mm -hmm. And sometimes as hard as that is, we do have to say no and walk away from um, maybe we're doing too much or we're spending too much energy and stress on relationships that don't create um, harmony in ourselves. And sometimes we have to make that decision I like that one. Do it in person, not online. Mm-hmm. 
my neighborhood gals do driveway driveway meetings during the warmer months. I like that. that Mahjong was... at a local senior center twice a week. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about some of these kind of tie into engaging your brain. So, you know, just like exercise and eating, we can tie the two together and socializing, and engaging the brain, which we'll talk about next, will tie in together as well. I, I would like have to put in a plug for, for our support group since this is a HOPE presentation. Yes. Uh, that's coming too, Lynn. All right, let's move on to the next one, which is tied in, engaging your brain. Uh, Engaging your brain across the lifespan can help build that cognitive, cognitive reserve. Um, the reserve develops over time through education, learning, curiosity. And the more formal education you have, the lower your risk of dementia. However, you don't have to go back to school to continue learning. Um, I know after I graduated college, I kind of started after a few years feeling dumb. <laughs> You know, and it's just that my brain was so used to learning and, and getting that information that there are classes you can take. There's even a class like this is a great example of engaging your brain. You're learning something new. So you don't have to go to, you know, back to school to do that. There's, you know, reading a book about a new topic. Um, when you, when you're learning you're creating that network in your, your brain that helps to better manage um, the potential of failures or um, declines. And it also helps it, your brain's ability to improvise and navigate around impediments that it may encounter that could prevent you from getting the job done. So it's critical thinking skills um, just that continual learning. I think um, switching up your routine. So, uh, you know, when you're driving to work or you're driving to the club to go swimming, going to your doctor, whatever you do, switch up the routine, take a different route. So your brain has to think, well, you know, and not use ways or some app, you know, if you, if you know your way, really think, well, maybe I, I'll take a turn left here. And so just things like that, learning a new language, there's a lot of apps out there um, to learn Spanish, French, German, all kinds of things like that. It's a little harder as we get older to learn a new language, because a lot of our um, brain networks have, have, you know, they're not as pliable as they were when we were five years old, but it's it's very doable. Learning a new instrument, um, the drums, I, I want to learn how to play the drums, <laughs> guitar, sculpting, painting, dancing. Um, I know that the Loop Key Center, Furstenberg Community Centers, they have a monthly dance there, which is sounds and looks like a blast, looks so fun. Um, and again, volunteering for different um you know, there's a lot of nonprofits in our community where they need volunteers, and it doesn't have to take up a lot of your time. Um, games, and someone mentioned the Mahjong, the community centers out in Battleground in Vancouver, they have pinochle games, they have bingo, they have uh, bunko. So, you know, there's a lot of different ways to engage your brain and socialize at the same time. All good stuff. Other ways that people can think of that they do, maybe share your input and how you engage your brain in the chat. Anything coming in, Lynn? I'm not seeing anything yet, uh, but I I can tell you that something that I would have never dreamed that I would do that uh, is challenging is all of those uh, 
all those different uh, games such as Words with Friends and things like that that uh, uh, engage your brain so that you're playing Scrabble online even with yourself I think is Yeah. helpful. Uh, puzzles of all kinds, word games, piano, Mm -hmm. teach piano to several older adults, visiting people such as uh, um, let's see, we're team reacted with a female thing like that, and I'm not sure I understand that. Ralph, can can we un, uh, can we let you talk? Mexican train. Well, here's a, a good one. Go through the grocery
Okay, Richard had his hand up. Well, we can come back to Richard. We have one more brain health key. Oh, wait a minute. We also have someone that said um, she likes to try new recipes. Oh, I love that. I yeah. do. That's also a good one. Mm -hmm. That's a very good one. Okay, that's it. Okay, well, let's move on to our final. What did I do? Uh, managing stress. <clears throat> so we all know that uh, stress is a part of life and you will always have stress in your life. The question is not really whether you have stress, but rather whether you're riding the waves or they're beating you up. Your own strategies for managing stress make a big difference in the health of your brain. Chronic stress can do damage to the brain through cell death and shrinking areas of the brain involving memory and mood regulation. This is such a huge um, factor in, I think out of all the six we've talked about, I think this is really one of the most important ones because it, it just, it changes your body in so many ways. So things that we can do um, to de-stress, focus on the present, um, try not to worry about what may never happen or what's already in the past. My grandma used to say, don't borrow trouble. You know, don't worry about things you can't control. Most things we can't control anyway. We can only control our responses to that. Um, keep a list of what's bothering you if you must think about it. Make a list. Um, schedule a few minutes a day or a week, 30 minutes a week to review the list. Focus on what you can control and, and let go of what you can't control. Breathing, give your break a brain. I mean, uh, your brain a break. Focus on on just your breathing. Um, there are a lot of apps out there and um, different things on YouTube that help teach you different ways to breathe. There's a lot of good books. Um, just sitting in a quiet place and focusing on that breathing. Build in meditation if if you like that. And yoga that brings in some exercise with it. There, but like I said, there are books and apps that help guide you through that sort of breathing or meditation. Um, saying no, you know, the, the one participant um, said, I had to say no to this relationship. Maybe you're doing too much volunteering. It's okay to say no, because we don't want to be overwhelmed. We, we can't do everything. Um, sit down and analyze uh, what is the most important things to you. Do that, because the more you add under your plate, the more stressful it is, especially if you're caring for a loved one um, with any ailment, especially Alzheimer's or dementia. Um, using imagery, um, sometimes photos of a favorite spot, um, place you've been or the place you want to go. When you feel stressed, could, um, you know, just give you, give your imagination a, a break and Picture being there, um, hopefully brings some serenity. Um, even smells, you know, maybe it's a trip you took to the Bahamas or some somewhere and you brought back um, something that might be a memory or a, a, a scent, you know, to bring you back to that place could be helpful. Someone mentioned journaling um, earlier. I think focusing on gratitude, things that we're grateful for instead of the negative can just help retrain our brains, focus on something positive, especially in stressful situations to just say, I can do this, you know, think positively, I can do this, I can figure this out, I'm going to be okay. It's as simple as saying, I'm gonna be okay, or, you know, helping someone else going through stressful situations, you're going to be okay. Um, we're going to figure this out. So keeping a gratitude journal um, can also help your focus on, 
on things and being focused on the present and what you're doing in your daily life. Um, focus on things that um, unfold naturally. Let things unfold naturally. This mindset may help um, to reduce anxiety that comes up especially with real unreal, unrealistic expectations. Focus on a specific problem at hand to protect yourself from making it even bigger. Um, not overthinking something. Maybe something happened and you're snowballing it into something that, that it's not. Really focus on the problem. What can you do to change it? If not, um, you know, let it go. And if you, if it's a big situation and you can make changes, you know, really come up with a plan that helps you get through that and manage the stress. I think I would say, you know, turning to unhealthy coping mechanisms. Um, if you get to that point where there are, you know, unhealthy relationships, drugs or alcohol, I think it would be time to talk to a professional about more healthy ways to manage stress and more healthy coping mechanisms. Um, so there is that. One more quick start tip if anyone else has any ideas that we didn't cover here. We're going to, after this, we're going to go into the sex part of that worksheet, the brain gain action plan. Kind of running into our time. So I want to make sure we get through this but this is an opportunity for any suggestions and tips that might help others how you handle stress so i missed a comment from the last section which i think is an important one and also a good way of de-stressing is uh judy volunteers her time to teach the bible to others i like that one And even doing things like that when we, um, it, it could also help relieve any stress. So many of these, all these six, um, you know, brain health topics, they all tie into each other and they're all connected to our mind, body, and spirit. Any other de-stressing ideas before we move on? I'm going to go ahead then, and people can still speak up as we go along. Lynn, Lynn can bring them in. So really getting started, as I mentioned, um, 21 days is how long it takes to, to break a habit or start a new one. It can seem daunting. It can seem overwhelming. But making those small changes and building up slowly um, can really make the difference. So on the worksheet, it looks like this, if you all got it. If you didn't, we'll resend it again and you can print it out and go through this on your, um, on your own time. But what this talks about is things you want to stop or start doing to improve. A brain drain is what you, uh, what's, you know, allowing your brain to think in the negative realm instead of the positive. Brain gains is what can, you can get rid of the negative and move into the positive. So you can actually use this, um, the first sheet, the, the action plan, Anytime you have scored low on one side or high, you can bring these into your brain drains and brain gains as a reference point. So like I said, if you're stuck, go back to that self-assessment. Okay. If we had more time, I would allow you to go through that, but we're kind of running toward the end here. Warning signs of cognitive impairment. Um, we're going to talk about the warning signs here so that we can encourage you, know, you to get 
um, your healthcare provider involved to address any issues if that is the case. If it's not with you, if it's a family member you're helping to take care of. Um, while this topic, um, brain health, isn't necessarily, we've talked a lot about dementia and Alzheimer's. It's not necessarily you know, related to that, but this is a component to that. Um, according to a 2020 survey, 80% of people want to reduce their risk of dementia. Only about 35% say they know the signs or symptoms of dementia. So these are 10 signs memory loss that disrupt day-to-day -day activities um, that, are, that are not your normal, just forgetting a name, forgetting where you put your keys, but they're just, they're constant um, that, that disrupts your day-to-day -day activities. Um, challenges in solving problems. Um, you know, if, if you notice you can't keep up in meetings or understand the information, couldn't make the numbers add up, that sort of thing. Difficulty completing familiar tasks. Um, you can't follow directions. You know, things are really looking different. All signs to, to talk with your healthcare provider. Confusion with time and place. Um, getting lost. Um, driving home. Things that you normally have not had an issue with in the in the past trouble understanding visual um, relationships and then balance are you off balance there is a uh, a resource i can send to you in or that i will have lynn include that you can kind of look into these further new problems with words and speaking where you're having to explain you know just kind of describe what you're what word you want to come up with um, instead of saying the word um, again these are more consistent things we all kind of forget like where did I put my keys and what was the name of that person um, it's also called the tip of the tongue phenomenon we call that in psychology where you know the word and then you wake up at two in the morning. That's the word. Um, that's normal. That's not what we're talking about here. It's it's consistent, um, not being able to remember places, things, people. Um, decreased and poor judgment. A lot of times this starts with financial. Um, you're making poor decisions regarding your money, um, maybe relationships. Withdrawal from work or social activities. Um, some people get embarrassed because they they think people are um you know maybe noticing things that are different and then changes in mood and personality um drastic mood swings maybe you sometimes you might not notice this in yourself necessarily but your family and friends do and it's a time to have a discussion and then the importance of early diagnosis and detection is screening does help um, also ruling out any other underlying conditions. A lot of times urinary tract infections um, can present as dementia and it could just be something as a simple antibiotic or maybe a medicine, medicine change um, that can rule out any, any type of idea that it might be going down a different road. Um, it also helps you with any care planning, financial planning, so if you have early detection, you can get in and get these assessments done. Um, uh, there might be some, some medications. That's, again, there's no cure for Alzheimer's, but there are some medications that help that can help with the process. Um, and again, having your loved one see a specialist if it, if it comes to that point. Um, there are some, you know, myths with regard to, and Lynn knows this is very well as, as our Dementia Friends class, uh, sessions teach us, um, life ends after diagnosis of Alzheimer's or other dementia. It's not true. You can still find purpose and meaning in life. Um, having dementia means you'll end up in a facility or a nursing home. You can create an environment um, that is nurturing and supportive in the comforts of your own home. And if, and if it re requires a, a move to a facility, there's still support there with family, staff, um, outside people. 
Caring for someone with the disease um, is impossible and overwhelming. There are resources, like I said, and, and support groups to help along with your caregiving journey. Uh, living well with dementia or Alzheimer's. I love this story and I'll kind of quickly go through this slide. Find and support. Hope Dementia Support has um, support groups. It's on their website. It's a resource with a hot link that Lynn will send you after this um, session. Engage in clinical trials if that's for you. You know, there's uh, you can still have goals and plans for your future. Explore new hobbies, strategies that help maintain your independence. Focus on current skills you already have and abilities. Um, this person you see in this picture, these masks, this is an example of someone, someone living well. Her name is Dr. Cynthia Hummel. She is living well with dementia. She has found a new passion through art. She makes masks that describe how it feels to have dementia. So these pictures in the background is her artwork. And she hosts art exhibits and wrote a book featuring her masks. She leads music groups and is also an advocate and speaks publicly about her journey with Alzheimer's to help others and educates lawmakers. Um, individuals like Dr. Hummel can live an amazing life with a diagnosis of dementia. She's a great inspiring example for others. Or she should be. I think that's amazing, Lynn, and probably something we should talk about later. <laughs> some of the yeah, some of the tips for um, care caregivers, care partners, I like to call family members, especially care partners or partnering to help with that loved one, whether it be a spouse, a parent, a sibling, um, even, a, even a child. Um, this slide right here, is something I will send you. So all of these are hot links to the safe safety licks or safety checklists. These are all home instead related. So that could get you started, but I will say this is not necessarily a home instead presentation, even though I work for them. There is There are a lot of resources out there. And so my goal, my aim, uh, in doing this workshop is to help provide as many resources as I, as I can without overwhelming you and at your own discretion to look into and whatever fits best for you um, would be my suggestion, what works for you. So you will get this tips for care partners. Um, again, this will all be on a Word document so you can just click you can control click and it'll take you right to that resource. So here's some other resources. These are sort of more global or Lewy body dementia, brain universe, um, Alzheimer's association. So those are some more global ones. These are some local resources I put together that I um, refer to a lot, Hope Dementia Support. Again, if you go to their website, they have a list of all the support groups in, um, in the area, including Battleground, Camas, Vancouver, um, so all the local ones. We also, um, there's a Dementia Friends and a Memory Cafe that's the last Wednesday of every month. Oh, I forgot to put the rest of Chastity's number there. But um, actually tomorrow morning, there's the um, a memory cafe. And it's so cool because people come, they bring their family, their loved ones. And there's usually some, there's a project of some sort, puzzles, games. Tomorrow we're painting St. Patrick's pots and planting flowers. But it's a way to socialize, um, engage in, in an activity. So we get all those centers those neurons in our brains firing. Um, you can get a coffee, you can eat um, you know, a snack. So it's a great way to engage. Friends of Hospice is another good resource. Carrying Closet, if those of you don't know, it's a nonprofit that um, gives away gently used durable medical equipment. So wheelchairs, hospital beds, anyone in need can go pick it up free of charge. 
CDM has an adult day center, which another, again, is another good resource if you need, if you want respite care for that family member to come in and do an activity, kind of get a break. So anyway, all the, the rest of these, Lynn will send them out to you. These are just some good resources out there um, to help you get through it. And any specific questions before we end our time together? I really appreciate your your listening to me. This is this is a kind of the first time I've done this presentation, so I apologize if I've stumbled a little bit. But um, I appreciate your attention, and hopefully, this information has been helpful to you. It was great, Debbie. Oh. Um, and and everyone, Debbie has given me permission to send out the PowerPoint as well. I want you all to be aware of the fact that. Uh, uh, next month, we will be talking about uh, caregiver burnout, another important conversation for uh, people who are caring for loved ones 24-7. So thanks a lot, Debbie, and thank you all for attending. And uh, we'll send stuff out soon, including the uh, YouTube link as soon as it's available. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.